Today on The King is Coming. So beware of people that are trying to run ahead of God. They're always trying to set some date for the rapture. There is no date for the rapture ever given in the Bible anywhere. The only thing you can know for sure is once the rapture occurs, all of these events are then going to occur. Hello, I'm Ed Heinsohn, and I want to be your teacher. I want to take the Bible, open it up, and help you understand the book of the Revelation, the most important prophetic book in all of the Bible, the book that ends the canon of Scripture because it tells us how everything is going to end one day. In fact, it not only tells you how human history will come to an end, it tells you how divine eternity is going to come to a beginning. So in a sense, it's a book of endings and beginnings because the end of the kingdom of this world ultimately merges into the kingdom of God on earth and the eternal kingdom of God in heaven itself. In other words, God is never finished with our lives and God is not even finished with planet earth. Now we're going to see today as we look at the wrath of the Lamb uh, in chapters 6 through 11, yes, there are some serious judgments that are going to come on planet earth. Judgments that the planet will not be able to escape, and yet even in the worst of them, God is still on the throne, and God will be accomplishing His eternal purposes. To enhance our study in the book of Revelation, I've written a commentary on Revelation, over 240 pages, that'll walk you through every chapter. It follows the seven-point outline that we're suggesting, and it gives us an explanation of the terms that are used in the book. The symbols in Revelation, which take up nearly half the book, are not written to confuse us. They're actually written to help us understand, oh, this is the meaning, this is the point. The dragon, or Jezebel, or Babylon, what do all those things mean? Why are they so cryptically given in the book of Revelation? Well, they're given so that we could understand the book, and the commentary will help you understand what the symbols are all about and the meaning and purpose of the judgments, the meaning and purpose of the coming of the kingdom of God, and the promise of the return of Christ, who's coming back to reign and rule on earth and coming back for you and for me. As we look at the book of the Revelation, we discover that it's an indictment on human nature. It's a revelation of divine power, but it reminds us that God is on the throne and God is ruling over the world in which you and I live, even when that world is falling apart. Sometimes we look at our own culture and say, my goodness, the preachers won't preach, the politicians won't lead, the people won't behave. We want to face the judgment of God and join hands and saying, God bless America or God bless whatever country uh, when we don't deserve the blessing of God. And God in His grace so often pours out grace and mercy in spite of us, but it's not always that way. You see, people like the loving message of Jesus when Jesus is showing grace and mercy, when He's healing the sick and raising the dead, and when He gives the Beatitudes, etc., but they forget about the rest of what He said. Jesus had more to say about hell than He did about heaven. He had more to say about judgment than He did about blessing because He wants to remind us there's two roads in life, two paths. There's the wide road that leads to what? Death and destruction and hell. There's the narrow road that leads to heaven and eternal life. So as we come today to Revelation chapters 6 through 11, the emphasis here is on the wrath of the Lamb. You say, well, would Jesus get angry with me? Would Jesus judge me? The answer of the Bible is a resounding and sobering yes. Take your Bible, go to chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, look at verse 1. Now, remember where we've been. Chapter 1, risen Christ, the preface, John, write the book of Revelation. You're not alone, I've come for you. 
Chapters 2 and 3, the proclamation, the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And then the third thing, the problem that had to be resolved, chapters 4 and 5, the Lamb appears worthy as the Lamb. He can open the scroll, uh, read the judgments, and bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. But He does so sternly. He does so with judgments. So when we come to chapter 6, verse 1, it says, I watched as the Lamb, there's that symbol again, and you might circle, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the one opening the seals. He opened one of the seals. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. And one of the four creatures said, Come and see. John has a heavenly perspective on earthly events down below. And this chapter opens with what we often call the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Verse 2, I saw a rider on a white horse, and to him was given a bow. Notice the word bow. You might underline that. Jesus appears in the book with a sword of his mouth, the symbol of the power of his spoken word. This is not Jesus. This rider on the white horse is the Antichrist, the imposter, uh, the one given the bow, the one given the Stephanos crown, the wreath is what it says in Greek, uh, and he went forth conquering to conquer. This is not Jesus releasing himself here. No, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is opening the seals, and he's going to give you a glimpse of what's coming in the future. These are seals of judgment that express the wrath of the Lamb. The rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. The beast, as he's called in the book of Revelation, he's showing you the big picture of what is coming. In verse 4, there's a red horse that takes peace from the earth that they might kill one another. The red horse of war. Uh, armies are marching. People are fighting. Yes, there are cosmic judgments in the book of Revelation, but you also have human war going on. The planet is at war, and the more we read these chapters, it starts sounding like nuclear war. In verse 5, the third seal is open and reveals the black horse of famine and devastation. And then in verse 7, the fourth seal is open and reveals the pale horse of death and hell followed after him. And then he goes on to say, and a fourth of the people on the planet were killed. The four horsemen of the apocalypse give us a kind of overview that's going to be followed eventually by the details. The Antichrist is coming, war is coming, devastation is coming, death is coming. Now, the message of God is always a message of hope and life. This side of eternity, there's hope. This side of these final judgments, there's hope. But one day, the world will step beyond the point of no return, and God will take His hand of blessing off this planet and allow us to plunge ourselves to the point of devastation. That, I think, is what is in view here in these chapters. Now, in my commentary on the book of Revelation, I'm going to walk you through the details of all of this. So if you like detailed study, it's available in here. Uh, we also have 15 future events that will shake the world. We're going to be looking at those in these chapters. And then if you like to chart it all out uh, in some kind of sequential order, let me recommend our book, Charting the Bible in Chronological Order. This book will help you understand how do the seal judgments work into the trumpet judgments and ultimately relate to what the book of Revelation is going to call the bold judgments. But for now, uh, let's look at these seal judgments. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, angelic riders racing across the horizon of the human experience. They race across the earth telling us, wow, look what's coming. We're releasing the Antichrist, war, devastation, and ultimately death, the pale rider. But then in verse 9, he opened the fifth seal and exposed those that were slain for the word of God. No longer are you going to be able to persecute and kill the believers and get away with it. No, why? Their souls are in heaven. And what are they doing? They're crying out for vengeance on earth. The persecuted, martyred church is crying out before the throne of God, the throne of God and the Lamb. 
for judgment. Why would Jesus judge the planet so severely? Because he's hearing the prayers and the cries of those persecuted believers. How long, O Lord, until you finally judge this ungodliness, this war, this chaos, this unbelief, etc.? And then in verse 12, he opened a sixth seal, and there was an earthquake that literally rocked the planet. The sun was darkened, the moon was like blood, the stars of heaven were falling, etc. These are all signs that the end is upon you in the return of Christ, who's about to come to planet Earth. These are not signs of the rapture. There are no signs for the rapture. The trumpet could sound, the archangel could shout, and boosh, we're out of here to the glory of God at any time, at any moment. Uh, Dr. Hitchcock and I have written a whole study on can we still believe in the rapture? I think the answer is obviously yes, uh, that the rapture will come in the timing of God for the family of God to take the bride home with the bridegroom. But the signs of judgment have to do with the return of Christ. So beware of people that are trying to run ahead of God. They're always trying to set some date for the rapture. There is no date for the rapture ever given in the Bible anywhere. The only thing you can know for sure is once the rapture occurs, all of these events are then going to occur. They are going to follow in order. The Antichrist is coming. War is coming. Devastation is coming. Death is coming. And the martyrs are crying out in heaven for judgment and vengeance on the unbelievers on planet Earth. And then there's an earthquake coming that's going to literally rock the planet and split the heavens. What is all of this? He says by the end of chapter 6, the great people of the planet are running and hiding. They're hiding in the dens and in the caves. Why? The planet is shaken to its core and the judgment is so severe they're crying on the rocks, fall on us. They're crying out to nature, deliver us. From what? Look at verse 17. The great day of His wrath has come. What wrath? Verse 16. The wrath of the Lamb. You see, Jesus makes available to us forgiveness, redemption, salvation. But when we say, no, 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 you will not rule over me. I'll take my own chances. You're going to end up with judgment and devastation. And ultimately, the whole planet's going to end up there. Because as the planet walks away from the God who created it, and says no to him again and again and again and again, they're ultimately going to plunge themselves into devastating war that will rock the planet to its core. That's the whole point of this. And the scripture says that is the wrath of the Lamb. When he takes his hand of protection and blessing off, judgment will fall. Now some people try to say, oh, the wrath of the Lamb doesn't begin until that sixth seal. No, it's the summary statement at the end of the chapter. It's all the wrath of the Lamb. Who's the main character in chapter 6, verse 1? The Lamb. Who opens the seals? The Lamb. Who releases the judgments? The Lamb. And by the 6th, they've had enough. No, we can't take it anymore. It's the wrath of the Lamb. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. But in the end, there is no hiding place. By the time you come to chapter 6, 8 verse 1, the seventh seal is opened and there's silence in heaven for about a half an hour. A holy hush comes over the heavens. Another response of literally worship. You see, throughout the book, worship is emphasized again and again and again. In the book of Revelation, people are praying, people are falling on their faces, people are responding in silence, people are shouting hallelujah, people are saying amen. This is a worshipful book. But they're worshiping God for who He is. But they're also worshiping for what He will do when He judges the unbelieving world and brings the kingdom of heaven to earth. And it's out of that seventh seal then that you have the sounding of the seven trumpets of judgment. Take your Bible and look at the eighth chapter. Look at verse 2. And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And these angels are going to come one after another in staccato fashion and blow the trumpet. These are trumpets of judgment for the planet. 
This has nothing to do with the last trump of the rapture. That's the last trumpet for the church age. These are trumpets of judgment during the time of tribulation. And he says in verse 7, The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood cast on the earth. So the first trumpet judgment is on planet earth. The second is a great mountain or ball of fire that was cast into the sea, into the oceans. And then the third angel, in verse 10, sounded his trumpet, uh, and there fell a star from heaven that polluted the rivers, the fresh waters. So you have this burning of the planet, the pollution of the seas, the pollution of the fresh waters, and then in verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third part, not all of it, total judgment comes with the bull judgments. The seal and trumpet judgments affect one-third of the planet. A third of the sun and the moon and the stars were blacked out. Well, that's air pollution. You can see it part of the day, but not part of the day. What we have here is the devastation of the planet in these trumpet judgments, and who's causing this? People are. They're bringing this on themselves. Armies are marching. People are fighting. The world is at war. And it starts to sound like nuclear war. As you read these chapters in detail, the grass is burning up. A third of the trees are burning up. The water's polluted. The air is polluted. The planet is rocked to its core. Now, the Bible obviously doesn't predict nuclear war specifically. Ancient people wouldn't have had any idea what in the world that was all about. They wouldn't have understood that. But it does tell us there's coming a time when the planet is shaken, the grass burns up, the trees are burning, the air is polluted, the water is polluted, balls of fire are falling into the ocean and on the planet. It sure sounds like nuclear war. Now, there could be a limited nuclear war prior to the rapture. Two countries could go at it with nuclear weapons. We pray they won't. We beg God for grace and mercy that it won't happen, but it could. But a global war, a global devastation, now the rapture's got to take place before that. You say, well, that would mess up your pre-tribulational rapture theology, wouldn't it? That would mess up everybody's eschatology. You're not going to bring in a post-millennial kingdom if it's all burned up. Uh, you're not going to bring in a survival of a post-tribulation era if the whole world is burning up and being destroyed. No, this sounds like total judgment falling on the unbelieving world, and it gets worse as time goes on. This is only the beginning. When you come to the end of chapter 8, verse 13 pronounces three woes. Woe, woe, woe to the earth dwellers, the unsaved inhabitants of the earth. Why? Because three more trumpet judgments are yet to come. Go to the ninth chapter. The fifth angel sounds his trumpet, and a star fell from heaven to earth. To him, a symbol of an angel, was given the key to the bottomless pit. He opened it, and smoke and fire came out of the bottomless pit. And then in verse 3, there came out something like locusts on the earth. But then he says they have stingers like scorpions. And then he tries to describe these locusts and he says of these locusts, they have breastplates of iron. Uh, they're flying about. Uh, fire shoots out the front and the back of them. They almost sound like helicopters. I think he's looking at modern weaponry in the distant future as God shows John from heaven what's going to happen in the future. He looks down through the tunnel of time, down through the halls of history, down into the canyon of eternity ultimately, and he looks into a future and sees a world at war with weaponry he can't even describe with first century terminology. So he does the best he can. It looked like it had a face like a man and long hair like a woman and fire shot out the back end of it. He'd never seen anything like that in his life. He's trying to describe the indescribable. A world in chaos. A world that has said no to God so many times they've gone beyond the point of mercy now and deserve the judgment of God, and these passages call it the wrath of the Lamb. It's so bad, it unleashes a demonic plague, a demonic horde in this chapter. These are not literal bugs. These are not radiation mutated locust biting people, uh, whatever. No, this is a demonically 
possessed army of people trying to destroy the world. Uh, in fact, their leader in verse 11 is called Apollyon, which means in the Greek language, destroyer. There's something about the depravity of human nature that ultimately, what does Satan really want to get us to do? Destroy ourselves? Destroy your life through drugs, destroy your life through uh, sexual immorality, destroy your life through uh, excessive materialism, destroy your life by worshiping the gods of this world instead of the God of heaven, destroy your life through an act of war, through an act of suicide, through an act of murder. All that self-destruction comes from the heart of Satan. Don't ever fall for the idea that the devil's your friend. I don't need God, Ed. I'm just me and the devil. We're just going to go down to hell and drink a bud together or whatever. No, the devil hates you. The devil wants to destroy you. And one day he's going to try to destroy this entire planet. Why? Because God has said he has a plan and a purpose for the planet. That he's going to bring the king to earth to reign and rule in his kingdom on earth. And Satan's going to say, oh, no, you're not. I'm going to motivate the hearts of these people because I'm the ultimate motivator of destruction, and I'm going to get them to destroy the whole place, and you won't have anything to rule over. And then he says, in verse 14, the sixth angel sounds his trumpet and looses the four angels bound in the great river Euphrates that runs right through the middle of modern-day Iraq. Uh, and what are they going to do? They're going to prepare for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay a third part of men. And the number of the army was 200,000 thousand or like 200 million. You have this demonically inspired army that is out of control. Now, the scripture doesn't make it clear. It, it, you know, some people say, well, only Asian countries have that many soldiers or whatever. Or maybe this is the last great jihad of some sort, uh, whatever it is whether it's European or Western or Eastern or Middle Eastern, it's out of control, it's inspired by the devil, and it's leading to destruction and devastation. And then he goes on to tell you in the details in these chapters, God will raise up in the midst of this two faithful witnesses that will preach the message of truth, will call people to faith, but eventually, by the time you come to chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. Heaven opens. The Ark of the Covenant is revealed. And it looks like the kingdom of God is about to come to earth. But we're really only halfway through the book of Revelation. There's much more yet to come. But we're given a glimpse of what is coming. The king is coming. And the kingdom is coming. God is coming to earth. Heaven opens, and God is about to step out. But before He does, He's got much more to reveal to us. Join us in our study week by week as we go through the book of the Revelation, make the complicated simple so that we're prepared to meet the King when He comes. There are a lot of people today who say, oh, the rapture, it's not in the Bible, or this is a new idea, or where in the world do you get this thing from? Zap, people are out of here all of a sudden? Well, Dr. Mark Hitchcock and I have just written our newest book, Can We Still Believe in the Rapture? We're going back to the biblical text to say, what does the Bible say about the rapture? What did the early church say about it? What have Christians said about it all through the Middle Ages, the time of the Reformation, even up to today? It's not a brand new idea. It's been around for centuries. Is there a difference between the time we're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and the time we return with Christ to the earth to reign and rule with Him? And if so, what should we be doing differently in the meantime in light of the message of the promise of the blessed hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to rapture the church home to the Father's house? Have you ever wondered how the world will end? What will it look like? Will you be a part of it? Is it coming soon? In his book, Revelation, How It All Ends, Dr. Heinsohn will give you invaluable insight into the end times. He pulls back the curtain of time to bring to life all the prophecies of the book of Revelation. To order your copy for a requested donation amount, call The King Is Coming today or go online to thekingiscoming.com. 
My guest today is Dr. Michael Rodelnik from Moody Bible Institute uh, in Chicago. Uh, Michael, my wife's a graduate of Moody many ah, years ago, good so choice. we have that connection. And uh, uh, one of the things I know that you have a real burden for are understanding the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that talked about the first coming of Jesus. One of those in Isaiah 61, Jesus quoted himself as though it were about himself, and yet I've read liberal scholars who said, oh no, this is not about Jesus at all. The prophet is talking about himself. Yes. Or this is third Isaiah who yeah. has this burden. The passage says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news or good tidings uh, to the poor and the meek, etc." cetera. Um, when you look at that passage uh, through biblical eyes and see the quote Jesus made of it, what resonates in your mind? Well, even just looking at the text itself, it seems to me so much more than what the prophet Isaiah could claim for himself. Uh, certainly the Spirit of the Lord God is on me and He has anointed me. A prophet could say that, but the word anointed also indicates, it's, it's the verbal form for the word Messiah. Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this, this is one who is to go out and heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, give freedom to the prisoners. Uh, now certainly that is not something that the prophet could do by himself. It's far greater to comfort all who mourn to provide for those who mourn in Zion and give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Uh, they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify Him. I think ultimately this is looking to the Messianic days. Uh, that's when, the Messianic age even yeah, that's in view there. Uh -huh. when, when Messiah is going to come and He will indeed provide that. However, the person who is going to do it is the Messiah Jesus and uh, He will do it in the future completely but he began to do it with his teaching ministry uh, and his preaching ministry. Actually in his own hometown in yeah. Nazareth. In Luke 4 it says that he went into the synagogue and they handed him the scroll and he read from the book of Isaiah and he said, today this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Why? Because the one anointed by the Spirit was there proclaiming liberty to the captives and teaching them the Word of God right there that day. Now, that emphasis that Jesus Himself makes about Himself, I don't see how you can look at Isaiah 61 as a Christian believer or scholar and say, I don't think it's about Jesus when Jesus said it. He did. Yes. I, I, I'm going to stand before Him one day in the judgment seat and I'm not going to say, I don't think this was about you or you made a mistake. No, I'm going with Jesus every single time. I think He knew exactly what it was about, that it was about Him and His earthly ministry that ultimately would set all of us free through faith in Him. World Prophetic Ministries is recognized as a church and religious organization by the Internal Revenue Service, and thus all donations to World Prophetic Ministries are recognized as charitable contributions under the IRS code. 